for it. Almost ready to go, huh? Yep. <laughs> I, think, I think, yeah, we're live now. Sounds great. Maima, I think uh, we should begin. We are live now. Yes, ma'am, we are ready. <laughs> Whenever you so, are. Should we wait for? No, I think we are live now on YouTube, so we should start. Or, or do you want to wait for five minutes for like everyone to come? Maima? She's frozen. Uh, she has a bit of internet issues. She'll just be right back. <clears throat> well, it's going to be a great event, hopefully. Yes, uh, hopefully. Oh, it will it be. Is. <clears throat> Sorry, my internet is She's back. Yes, sorry. So, uh, should we start? Yeah. Okay. So, a uh, warm welcome to all our panelists, Dr. Hena Ganjawala, Dr. Disha Sharma, Dr. Sunil Singh, who is joining us from South Africa, and Dr. Dumi, who has joined us from Texas. To all our IDS members and our viewers, I am Mahima Gulati, the Vice President of IBS India. On behalf of IBS India, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this one-of-a-kind event which has been very thoroughly curated to provide clarity on the opportunities for an undergrad veterinary student after the completion of their degree. I would like to begin by thanking all the IBSA members from IBSA Bangalore, IBSA Bhubaneswar, IBSA Bidar, IBSA Kashmir, IBSA Mumbai, IBSA Orthanadu, and IBSA Pukod for their constant efforts and dedication in the preparations for this event and to bring this event to this stage of success. International Veterinary Students Association, India, is the largest veterinary student body in our country, an organization, IBSA Global. Our aim is to encourage the potential of veterinary students, their skills, education, and knowledge, and enhance the overall standard of their academic experience in the country to ultimately improve animal welfare. With the aim of clearing uncertainties and guiding aspiring veterinarians, on education and career prospects in India as well as abroad, IVSA India, with the support of its local chapters, presents to you Vet, Set, Go! Get up for the future. This is a two-day online panel discussion consisting of all the queries and doubts that we have received from our viewers being very aptly answered by the team of our expert panelists. With this event, we hope to reach out to a large number of veterinary students as well as the students who are aspiring to get an admission in a vet college and provide them with all the nitty gritty they require to have a more transparent idea about the future. Before we begin this event, it gives me great pride and honor to present to you SEVA, Students Endeavor for the Welfare of Animals. This is a small step by IBS India to contribute to the welfare of the stray animals and to be a helping hand to the needy. In this campaign, we give the platform to one deserving student 
who is constantly going out of his or her way, be it a pandemic, to help out to the needy strays, feed them, provide them the required treatment and shelter. These are the individual students of these stray animals. With this campaign, we hope to provide these students the support they need so that they can continue working for this noble cause without a pause. I would like to introduce to you one such student, Hunar Goel, who is from IVS in Mumbai. She is a third year student from the Mumbai Veterinary College and has been endlessly working for the welfare of stray animals in her area. From feeding to the treatments to fostering, she does it all. We would like to show you a short video about Hunar's story, and we would urge you to please contribute to this noble cause. Hey guys, my name is Hunar Goel, and I've been doing a lot of treating, feeding, and fostering since the long time began. As the lockdown was imposed and we all were confided to our houses, there was always a prick at the back of my mind that, oh God, who are feeding the street? And also giving them belly rubs. Initially, I used to feed 10 to 15 dogs, which increased to more than 50 in a span of two months. I have feed them dog food with milk and sometimes rice with chicken and also leftover veggies to cows and bulls. As a budding veterinarian, I vaccinated puppies with 9-in-1 primary plus booster and 85 plus dogs with anti-rabies. Gave first aid up to my capabilities, did regular health checkups and also with the help of Parava treated TVT cases on the spot. Females with mammary tumor were treated with surgery and after post-op, they were released back to their area. Horrible accidents like this spinal fracture, leaving no hope for the female to be releasing back to her area, was sent off to an amazing NGO called Earthlings Trust. Arrive on the location and see the condition of the baby. Take the baby to the veterinarian. As you can see, it's a complete fracture. Decide to go for surgery, which was preferred for pinning surgery. Get the pinning surgery done, cost a lot of money, a month of post-op care. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Hanar, for sharing your video. Uh, this is such an amazing initiative on your part that you undertook during the lockdown. Uh, we urge all our viewers to please support Hunar's selfless service to the welfare of the stray animals by donating whatever little uh, you can help her with in this venture. Uh, we, all read, we are already proud of you, Hunar, and I'm sure this has inspired many of us to do a good deed for the animals. Um, okay, so before I introduce our panelists, I would like to instruct all our viewers that you can put on uh, all of your questions in the comment box and we will try to cover as much as the time, uh, time prevails. And those questions which are not answered will be mailed to you later. So I guess we can begin with the event. Um, so hi guys, I'm Malika Shah from Bombay Veterinary College. Uh, I'm the treasurer of IVSA India. Uh, along with me, uh, we have Manoj Kumar from Tamil Nadu. Uh, studying in Veterinary College and Research Institute uh, from Ortha um, Nadu. And we will be the speakers for today's event. Uh, I would like Manoj to introduce our first panelist. You have to unmute yourself, Manoj. Uh, Manoj, uh, unmute yourself. Oh, sorry, it's been a great honor in introducing Dr. Muzaffar Makdumi. Dr. Muzaffar was born and raised in Kashmir, India, where he obtained his bachelor's degree in veterinary science and animal husbandry from Sheth Kashmir University of Agriculture Science and Technology. Upon graduation, he completed a rotary internship with focus in livestock medicine. Later, he received a master's degree in veterinary microbiology and immunology 
where he successfully developed a vaccine against food rot in sheep. He also done a PhD in biological science at Warwick, UK. Magdom is doctor. He pursued an additional master's in preventive veterinary medicine at the University of California, David. While also completing livestock herd health reproduction, during his residency, he gained a vast experience in population medicine, biology, disease surveillance, and monitoring management of infectious disease and individual at at uh, the well he currently works in texas animal health commission we welcome you sir for this event okay so most of us our next panelist is dr hena ganjwala uh, dr hena ganjwala has completed her bachelor's in veterinary science from mumbai veterinary college in 2013 and masters in conservation medicine from Murdoch University Australia in 2015 she has also done a course in wildlife medicine in south africa and has worked with a plethora of birds reptiles large mammals and carnivores uh, she has worked at perth zoo and kanyana wildlife rescue center uh, where she has treated a wide range of animals and birds she specializes in birds turtles tortoise snakes rabbits guinea pigs hamsters and all kind of exotic animals and native wildlife She runs Critter Care uh, Veterinary Clinic in Mumbai, which is primarily an exotic and avian pet practice, uh, along with medicine and surgery of urban wildlife. She is also a consultant and a part of Wildlife Trust of India's Emergency Response Network. Thank you, Doctor, for being with us today. uh manoj we can't hear you uh, no we can't hear you yet am i audible yes okay next i go with dr disha sharma she has done her bachelor's course from mumbai veterinary college and masters of wild animal health from royal veterinary college london she has achieved a certificate of cetacean standing management from british divers marine rescue uk She has worked as a field veterinary consultant with Vidarbha Tiger Project Wildlife Trust of India was also a part of Turtle Survival Alliance as a veterinary officer in Lucknow worked as a vet- vet- veterinary physician at WST and Plant and Animal Louis Society in she was also a part of Endangered Species Recovery Program Rural Wildlife Conservation Trust she is a visiting veterinarian consultant in Kodiyar Animal Wel- Wel- Welfare Trust we welcome you ma'am for the show Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so our next panelist is Dr. Sunil Singh. Dr. Sunil Singh has done his bachelor's in veterinary science from Bombay Veterinary College in 1984 and master's in animal science from the University of Illinois, USA in 1990. He completed his doctorate in medicine of biochemistry toxicology from the University of KwaZulu Natal, South Africa. He has been a part of South Africa uh, Veterinary Association, Mitchell Park Trust, SPCA Management Committee, and many more. He has also published articles based on pharmacology and histology. Uh, he is a director of Vet Care uh, Animal Clinic at Durban. Uh, Dr. Sunil Singh has dedicated himself for uh, furry friends as well as Mother Nature. Uh, we are glad to have you, Doctor. Um, yeah. now let's get into the discussion part uh, questions which are com- which every common student face about going to abroad for their uh, masters or phd let's uh, go with the first question at what point in your education did you decide that you want to move abroad for higher education let's start with La- dr muzaffar oh at what point well thanks um... Yes well thank you very much first of all it's a great honor to be here amongst you all and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my experiences with you all today um so the question was posed that at what point did i d- decide that i want to go abroad and pursue my education i think um i'll definitely tell you right when i entered the veterinary school in kashmir and i i definitely had a knack at that point um right from the day one i got in and uh, there's a reason one of my you know a lot of my family um, members they were into into human medicine and they had already been exposed to 
to um, international training um, abroad. Uh, so that that was already at the you know that seed was there at the base of my mind, and I had I had decided at that point when I entered the vet school, I'm definitely going to pursue my higher education with masters and PhD and clinical training um, um, abroad um, in the in the Western countries. Uh, then that interest grew um, over the course of four years. Um, of course, I, I you know, uh, chose a path where that path would lead to um, international education. It would make it easy. And so basically to answer your question, uh, it was right at the, at the beginning of the vet school when I definitely had an interest in pursuing uh, my education abroad. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Next, I go to Dr. Sanil Singh. Very much uh, when I was still in high school. Uh, and one of the reasons I came to India to study was I was not afforded the opportunity to study in uh, my country of birth, which was South Africa at that point in time. So it was a political reason. And uh, secondly, it was an opportunity to come back to India where my ancestors had come, in, uh, come from and to actually learn about my culture. So for me, the education was just not veterinary, but was an opportunity to come in touch with my, my uh, ancestry. So that was school, just post after school, uh, rather than at a later stage. Uh, subsequent to that, when I did my postgraduate, uh, again, it was driven by politics. Uh, we were still living very much a country that was uh, torn apart by racial discrimination. And that was the reason I chose to go to the United States and eventually returned when apartheid was dismantled during the release of uh, the late President Mandela. So that's basically my story in a nutshell. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next, Dr. Disha Sharma. Um, thanks again, guys. Uh, I think for me, it was uh, somewhat uh, pretty much like how uh, Musafar described. It was my older sister who was pursuing her master's in the US. Uh, in 2008, I, uh, well, 2007, I'd already graduated from Bombay Veterinary College. It was still Bombay Veterinary College at that time. And uh, uh, in 2008, I was in the U.S. to uh, for her graduation. And I was like, this is, for me, it was more an experience that I had to step out of my comfort zone and kind of go and not only get myself uh, a higher education, but also get some cultural education, something different from what I'd been seeing. Um, I think it started then, and it was much, much later, and I'm sure we'll hit that point uh, in a bit, when I finally decided that, yes, I want to go abroad and pursue something other than where I was already comfortable at. But that was me. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Next, we go to Dr. Ina. Okay, so um, I actually uh, was very interested in wildlife. I think around my third year, I realized I wanted to work with wildlife. Um, so that's when, I mean, I kind of just started looking around, um, but, uh, and I wanted to, you know, kind of the whole fascination of, oh my God, there's so much more conservation work going on, um, you know, everywhere. I want to learn some more and, at that point, um, it, actually in my third year, I went to South Africa to do a course and it was called the Introduction to Wildlife Medicine to you know, kind of uh, know whether this was the thing for me and I completely fell in love with it. Uh, and uh, you know, that particular uh, place was associated with uh, Murdoch University, which is where I went for my master's later. So uh, that's where it kind of started building for me. Thank you, ma'am, thank you. Since a BVSC degree is not recognized in many countries, what are the exams or formalities one must complete to secure admission there? Uh, Dr. Sanal Singh, would you like to go first? Often, uh, if you are going to be working in an institute, and in, this, in the case of South Africa, the Veterinary Institute allows people to come for postgraduate education with a limited um, area of practice. So you you get ratification from the vet council that allows you to practice within the realms of the academic environment. So 
in the event that the student say chooses to do uh, maybe what I need to clarify, if you are going to a veterinary faculty to pursue postgraduate education, there are two degrees that are offered. It's an MSc in veterinary sciences or an MMed vet. The MSc is a purely academic qualification uh, in your chosen area of veterinary science. The MMed vet tends to be in the clinical areas and some of the paraclinical areas and is structured differently. Usually the MMed vet. Uh, is a four-year program, which comprises uh, about 90 credits of uh, theoretical work, and then you need to put on an X number of hours in practical work. So getting admission to a postgraduate institute is not the problem, provided you qualify academically, provided spaces are not taken up by local graduates and there's an availability of space. And I think the third thing often lots of people ask, and which was a question I asked in the early 80s, was, was there funding? And not always there is funding for foreign graduates. But sometimes you might be pretty lucky if your supervisor has a lot of surplus funds, which comes from private institutions, or might have a particular area of research that you might actually fit, and you could possibly be taken in in such areas. So. Uh, that's that's one area if you're going to veterinary faculties. If you're going to non-veterinary faculties, most of the degrees are by research. And uh, again, the same rules apply. The question about recognition of the degree, I mean, I had the problem when I returned to South Africa from India. My degree was not recognized. Uh, there was the added issue of political discrimination. And I know I've said this a few times. But it was a serious problem. Um, and one had to write board examinations in order to qualify. Uh, eventually, we got through that. And it was just not me. There were about a handful of us that returned from India. There was about 10 of us who eventually went through this whole thing. It took some people up to four years to get through the exam. Uh, however, now the exams are a lot more fairer. Uh, there's a lot more information disseminated. Uh, the institute is a lot more helpful. There's far less discrimination. In the case of foreign students who are coming temporarily, they might be able to acquire a temporary license to practice within the realms of the academic environment and research. However, for a lot of foreign graduates, like um, it is for the United States, TOEFL, or the test of English as a spoken or uh, a written language has to be taken. And in some cases, the students may need to write an exam under veterinary jurisprudence or to be familiar with the laws that govern veterinary medicine in the country, which is generally not a big exam, and one can get through it. If one wants full practicing uh, expansion or, uh, or to be able to practice as a general vet, then one has to write the board examination. However, if one has passed the MRCVS, that's a member of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, one would be given reciprocity in this country or in South Africa. I hope that answers most of the questions. Yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Mustafa, would you like to talk on this? Can you all hear me okay? Yep. Okay, thank you. Well, certainly, um, I think you know, since I have obtained education from three different continents, I want to throw, you know, I want to put some light on on um, each aspect in each country, the requirements for um, for, for entry, for, uh, you know, practicing. Uh, since your question is degree or BVSC is not recognized, I, I mean, I will have to say certainly we are, so there are, If we, let's, let's start off with the colleges in the United States. So there are AVMA, which is American Veterinary Medical Association accredited schools. These are the ones that are veterinary schools in the United States. But there's also AVMA listed schools. So those are the ones that are definitely multiple um, veterinary colleges in India that are among the AVMA listed schools. So if you are, whether or not you're from an AVMA accredited or listed school, you can certainly pass the requirement exam of that particular country to be able to practice as a veterinarian or pursue higher education. Now, if you were to, it depends on what your interests are. If you were to go in the field of research, 
then from there, what you would need to do, the main requirement here in the United States is the GRE, which is a graduate record examination. So once you pursue your master's in India or your bachelor's degree and you want to go for either an integrated master's PhD program or you come to the U.S. to do a PhD after your master's in India, you certainly would have to take the graduate record exam. <clears throat> Again, there is there's multiple resources available online, and I bet you know pretty much everybody in India would know what a G, what GRE exam is. After you pass your GRE exam, you would need to apply to the university again, like Dr. S uh, Singh said just now. It depends on the funding. It depends on your overall you know letter of recommendations, literally your application packet, which we can go in detail later on, but. But that's what the main requirement would be, the GRE and, of course, the, the application for PhD. And the paramount is whether or not there's funding available. Um, however, if you were to choose a clinical route, you want to come to the United States and practice veterinary medicine and you're not interested in any research, then, first of all, you have to be licensed in this country to be able to practice veterinary medicine. And now how we can get that license once you have a BVSC degree from India, the next step is to apply for the ECFVG, which, is, which stands for Education Commission for Foreign Veterinary Graduates. So it's a four-step process. Number one, Dr. Singh already said TOEFL, which is your basically testing your English, English skills. So test of English as a foreign language. So once you pass that, it's a pretty straightforward exam. No, shouldn't have any complication whatsoever. Um, second of all, the second step is assessment of your, you know, basically verification of your credentials. So the United States um, ECFEG, the, the, the Education Commission Board, once you apply, they will send your documentation back to the university where you graduate from just to verify. So that's called as verification of credentials. Once that happens, now the critical two steps our BCSE, which is our number three step in that process, which is basic sciences, um, technically basic science exam. So that tests your veterinary knowledge that you attained in your first and typically second year, and then some of the you know third year. Um, <clears throat> so that's this. These are about um, I would say about two hundred questions, and it's a multiple. You know, it's an um, it's an online test you'll have to take. I believe there are some centers in India, perhaps. Uh, I'm not sure. You would need to look into that. Um, but BCSE is number three. And the fourth step, which is very important, is your clinical skills. So um, for that, you would have to be able to, you would have to come to the United States if you're applying from India to come to the U.S., take that clinical skill exam. Once you pass that clinical skill exam, again, it's a multi-day exam. Um, you have to go through a different, you know, um, specialties like um, equine, large animal, livestock, you know, small animal. So you have to be able to perform a spay and a neuter on a dog and be able to preg check, be able to do a lameness exam in horses. You know, all sorts of very basic um, things that a veterinarian must know. Uh, those are the sort of requirements there. Once you are, once you pass those four steps, now your BVSE degree is equivalent to a DVM, that's that's a degree here in the Doctor of Veterinary Medicine in the U.S. After you've passed that, the next step is the North American Veterinary Licensing Exam. So I'll take a step back. The ECFVG process is only to recognize your degree. Now you are at the U.S. You're with the as compared to you know with the U.S. standard, you are equivalent to that. Your next step from here is going to be your North American veterinary licensing exam. It costs about $600 or so um, to sit that test. And just for an information purpose, every American graduate, every US DVM student, they take this exam in the final year, in the fourth year of vet school. Um, veterinary education in America is only four years, it's not five years. So every candidate, every student, they have to take, it's a must. So you definitely have to take that exam to be able to recognize by the board um, as a practicing veterinarian. Then as Dr. Sonal said um, just now, there's jurisprudence exam. Now, if you're interested to practice in, for example, I am in the state of Texas. If you're interested to practice in the state of Texas, so after you take the NAVLI, the North American Veterinary Lasting Exam, 
you got to take the state boards. So whatever state you want to practice veterinary medicine in, uh, you would have to take the state specific licensing exam. And that actually is more of a jurisprudence exam. So it shouldn't be, you know, I took that exam, I believe, you know, before the COVID hit, I had to take that exam um, to be licensed, uh, you know, in, in the in the state of Texas uh, to work for the Texas Animal Health Commission. So, um, so um, you know, so so those are those are, in my opinion, the, the 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 main requirements for practicing veterinary medicine in the U.S. However, going back to the United Kingdom, where I pursued my PhD, if you were to again practice veterinary medicine in the U.K you'd have to go through the MRCBS process, the Royal Veterinary College. They have laid out their requirements. So I would just go on the Royal Vet College um, and look at the, the requirements requirements there. If your interest is pursuing research in, in England, then of course, this is not a requirement. You probably may not be even taking the GRE because most of the UK universities do not have the graduate record exam requirement. However, they do have a, um, an English language test requirement, which they call it IELTS. Um, so I, IELTS, uh, so, so you can certainly look up IELTS and look, it's, 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 it's a comparable test to TOEFL. Um, Americans prefer more TOEFL and, 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 and Brits prefer IELTS. So uh, both exams are valid in both countries. And so, so this is my take on that. That's all I have. Thank you, sir. That was quite indeed, and thank yeah, you so no much for that. Um, um, okay, so the next question is actually directed to Dr. Henna. Uh, which are the universities in Australia that provide courses for wildlife medicine? So if you're actually looking at uh, wildlife medicine, um, I, uh, they don't uh, really have a course for vets, for international vets to study that because it is a more uh, clinically based, um, uh, it's a clinically based masters. Again, just like Dr. Singh had mentioned, um, you know, being uh, uh, like our degree is, um, I mean, we have, we can do a masters there, but there are certain limitations to uh, how much we can practice. Um, so. Uh, we do get coursework but also um you do not uh, get direct access into the hospital uh if you want to do that you have to give the national qualifying exam uh in australia as well so uh but the universities that offer is of course murdoch uh, that uh, uh, you know if i could do conservation medicine there um also there's uh, the university of melbourne and uh, also uh, james cook uh, so uh, Sydney also has a course in uh, wildlife medicine. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Disha, this is for you. Is it better to go for master's abroad right after BBSE or shall we wait till we finish our MBSE? How is the education system different from ours and there? Okay, so I think I should uh, firstly give a disclaimer saying that uh, all of us, all of us panelists here, we're here to share our experiences and uh, the path we took might not be the path that works, you know, exactly for you and you'll have to uh, carve something out for yourself. So I'll share with you my experience and then you can make of it uh, whatever you want to. Um, so what I did was uh, after I graduated from Bombay Veterinary College in 2007, I practiced in Bombay first. I wanted to um, hone my skills as a veterinarian. I think most of you might uh, agree with me that it's only when you start practicing, really, really practicing at a clinic or at a shelter is when you kind of uh, understand the nitty gritties of our very, very challenging profession where you don't necessarily have someone, you know, guiding you all the time. And it's the time when you have to take decisions on your own. So I would encourage people to do that. Uh, but that's me. I would say get out of your, your college, do your bachelor's degree, and then uh, find out what this profession is all about. See what you're made of. Um, and I did that. And only after, and I really enjoyed it. I worked at a shelter and at a clinic uh, at the same time. 
So it kind of gave me, you know, working with stray dogs where, you know, uh, no ownership of an animal. And then I had people at a clinic who, you know, of course, they claim ownership and they were responsible for an animal. And so that's really important, too. Um, and that eventually led me to saying, that, do I really want to do a, a nine to five job? I loved it. Don't get me wrong. I love the shelter job the most. I think there's nothing more rewarding than going to a shelter and you have so many you know, uh, tails wagging when you when you enter. I found that very fulfilling. But at the same time, I couldn't see myself in in a room from morning till evening. And ooh, for me, clinical practice is really difficult, I must admit. <laughs> Trying to tell why your dog does not need an injection, you know. It doesn't, so it doesn't. But anyway, uh, you'll you'll get to it uh, at some point, um, and and that's what led me. I think my experience led me to saying, "Hey, I've always thought about wildlife, and I've always thought about wildlife conservation. So I need to know more about this." And that's what led me to going to Doral Wildlife Conservation Trust um, for a short course that. Uh, they, I think they still continue to uh, do, which is called uh, Ind Endangered Species Recovery Program. And that allowed me to meet a whole lot of people that allowed me to go see uh, a, you know, a zoo. So Dutter Wildlife Conservation Trust is also a Jersey Zoo. Um, and you know, to see what uh, working in a zoo is all about. And that slowly kind of got me on the path saying, yes, I think this is something I want to pursue. And that's what slowly I started finding out more and more, talking to more and more people. Having met the vets at Dural Wildlife Conservation Trust, they pointed me to uh, you know, other avenues, the possibilities. And I, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, if you are not 100% sure of you know, which way you want to go, it's OK. Ask questions. Um, introduce yourself to people. Uh, it's, it's absolutely fine. And that's what I did. Um, and only so 2007 is when I graduated from Bombay Veterinary College and in 2011 is when I went to Royal Veterinary College uh, for uh, my master's degree having had that much time to get a grip on clinical practice here in India figuring out what next steps I wanted to take and how I wanted to achieve them and then getting my admission to go to Royal Veterinary College and uh, uh, as for the experience, I think that was the next uh, bit of your uh, question. It it was quite different, of course, very, very different. And uh, I think unlike uh, Hena's experience um, in Australia, so uh, UK and Royal Veterinary College, they did allow us uh, clinical practice, but that was under, so they have, so uh, RCVS, um, that Dr. Sanil uh, Singh and uh, Muzaffar have both uh, touched upon. Um, they give you a certificate, basically saying, so under the name of Royal Veterinary College, so what I got was saying, so you are now basically a ward of Royal Veterinary College, and now if she goofs up, she's your responsibility. So if you have a senior watching over you, you're allowed into clinical practice. Uh, as long as the surgeon at hand, your senior says, yes, you can be part of the surgery, you can do it all. Um, and uh, that brings me to, sorry, stepping back to the previous set of questions. So something you guys can also do uh, if you're trying to figure out what you want to do and how to proceed with the, uh, with the uh, examinations for the MRCBS is something called a seeing practice. Uh, yes, the uh, information is all available on uh, the RCVS uh, webpage. And seeing practice is basically you're applying for uh, the certificate saying that I will be practicing under somebody who is an MRCVS and under their guidance, I will continue to train. So I think that is something you guys should look into. Um, Overall experience, it allowed me to meet uh, people from, I think, almost all over Europe. Uh, there were people from the Caribbean. Uh, and as I said earlier, uh, it was a great um, cultural education for me as well, uh, other than uh, the wildlife medicine part of it. So, yeah, I hope I answered your question and didn't go off track completely. No, no, no thank you. Okay. Yes. Okay, so the next question is, uh, what all things are required for applying for master's or PhD? Um, 
like uh, does cgpa matter and is there a minimum requirement for admission um dr sanil singh postgraduate degree it's it's a competitive application so clearly good grade point averages a good cv uh, being very clear about what you want to do finding the right mentor or the right supervisor or all the things that matter uh, i found in my particular case uh, i wasn't sure exactly which way i wanted to go i think very much in mind was we were in the 80s inspired by james heriot uh, and many of you may have read james heriot's novels so a veterinarian in many ways was a specialist already and his speciality was animals and the question is which species did i want to work with and i wanted to be a, a generalist in many ways in that whatever species walked into my door or into my clinic or wherever i was practicing i should be able to attend to so primarily uh, the choice of what you want to do again i think this is the issue that everybody has addressed to some extent in the preamble is that you need to find your way and find what fits you well you know it's like a shoe fits you well you're comfortable with it that's where your confidence grows from so in my case i chose to actually go into animal sciences because the preference was to actually have a better idea of all the species that i could possibly work with also to get a little bit more experience from the agricultural and food animals because as a veterinarian we're not simply clinicians but we also a very integral part of the one health or what we called in the old days is veterinary public health and hence human health so those were all the things that i would compute into my decision making process so i had to find a place where i would fit in well and i did apply to a number of institutes in the us and generally the standard uh, response you would get is we require a, a grade point average of x y and z and generally it will often be higher than you had <laughs> and uh, you know it's a very difficult process and generally the first letters are quite negative but one must pursue and there's always a place for somebody somewhere and i was fortunate enough to be admitted to the university of illinois which is a, a very good university has a very high standing in the united states i think dr muzaffar will bear uh, credence to that like the universities that he's gone to california davis excellent veterinary university so that's where i started to find my feet and i started to delve into other aspects of veterinary science so you would find that probably if one looks at my cv it started with a number of experiences in different areas and and this is still my stance today that i do a number of things because that's what i enjoy i enjoy the variety in veterinary science so bottom line grade point average is important but is not the ultimate two a lot depends on your motivation Three, I think a lot depends on the type of experience you had, and what stood me in good stead was the variety of experiences I had, varying from uh, teaching in the early days uh, at, uh, at at a junior college in some aspects of public health. The second thing was the variety of species that I I dealt with, farm animals as well as domestic animals and wildlife. So I had a good CV, which was far better than my grade point average. Thank you. We can't hear Manoj. Manoj, that's better. Yes, we can hear Mike. Yes. Uh, we can't hear you yet, Manoj. Manoj, ille, Manoj, ille. While, while Manoj tries to figure that out, we can't hear you, Manoj, but I will add something to what uh, Dr. Sanil just said. Uh, you're very right. So, And I will very happily admit my GDPA was only 6.94. All right. But your experiences add to it. If it's low for you, don't lose hope because there's so much more that you can do. You're, uh, you, know, you are not just the numbers. 
it's all your accumulation of uh, all of your experiences and that's what i did uh like the young uh, veterinarian at the beginning whose video we saw uh, forgive me i forgot your name you know so i i did things like that when when i was younger like even before i joined veterinary medicine and uh, so af and after graduation you know just volunteering for a little bit at bombay veterinary college volunteering with the other veterinarians so these are the kind of things you do to add to your personality and that is what you're presenting eventually uh, to any university and saying that hey this is why you should invest in my education so yeah thanks manoj i hope you're sorted now i think i'll take over manoj's question yeah. i think mean, manoj is sorted <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what all things should we consider to make sure that we get into a dream college like how to make our tv uh, cv stand out or extra curricular activity that we should join uh, dr muzaffar all right i'm unmuted now Okay, great question. First of all, I think my you know other panelists uh, they just covered uh, they talked about the C the great found uh, you know great point average in and other extracurricular activities. But from a CV standpoint, what is more critical? First of all, of course, your educational you know um, your your academic credentials. If you're able to get the, obtain the highest GPA. do it no no doubt about that that certainly is going to stand you out from rest of the crowd however if you're not able to do that that's not end of the world again you know people talked about um, gpas my gpa was also close to 7 it was not even 7 it was less than 7 and i'm now regional director with with one of the state government agencies in texas so you can that sort of gives you a little bit of motivation there um at the same time <clears throat> once you you your cgpa you know other than that what's needed if you have any lecture series going on in your department or any presenter that comes to your school whether it's a remote presentation whether it's um, it's a seminar i would certainly encourage you to go and join that you know um what you could do after you've you know uh, completed your your um, educational credentials you can put lecture series attended put down the names of the lectures important ones of course uh, you know you don't want to put down like a class lecture or seminar or something like a you know master's thesis seminar or things like that um so so that would certainly you know help number 3 if you have any awards scholarships or um you know any uh, accomplishments definitely put them on your cv so that should be one of the section itself um with respect to your awards scholarships and and that um it necessarily does not have to be a world renowned scholarship any fund you got from a, a trust or a non um, uh, you know ngo or 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 a university or you know even if it's 100, a 100 a thousand um rupees uh, scholarship fund still put that on that definitely counts that you are you're capable to obtain even if it's a 500 rupee fund it still means a lot it doesn't matter how much it is it means you are capable to to be able to compete that number 3 if you have any um research publications of course i'm not expecting at your veterinary education level in your in your undergraduate degree to have publications and things however if you have an opportunity if there's a research project going on in your department say for example mostly these are within the department of microbiology or veterinary public health um so you can approach those folks the department head and say hey i'm willing to gain some you know um, i i want to gather some experience in research could i just voluntarily assist you in your lab perhaps preparing media you know washing dishes i mean it's not this is what a lab person does they got to clean their own you know autoclave that's necessarily, not necessarily washing dishes but autoclave autoclaving you know microbiological microbi equipment and things like that that certainly would go on your cv assisted with this research project you know things like that and it's very important if you have also networked or assisted any other students that are um below below you for example you're a fourth year student a first year student approach that hey i need assistance with this put that up there you know um a, a mentorship for this particular student when i was i'll tell you my personal experience when i was in vet school i used to teach the the laboratory um you know practicals 
um, to to undergraduate students. So that was part of big section in my in my CV. Of course, if you have networked with any people, you know we do. A, I feel like people in India, back in India, they we do a lot of things that we necessarily do not think is are important. But in the countries abroad, this is what matters. Are you a multitasker? How much can you think outside of the box? You know, education, grade point, everybody does that. But what have you done outside of that? So that should be your full package. So I think I covered my basic, um, you know, important aspects of academics, scholarships, um, networking, volunteership. If you have volunteered at a veterinary clinic or if you have done a neuter spay clinic or, or um, what you call it, uh, like Dr. Sherman, you know, Disha just covered, you know, if you're at a, at a shelter um, organization or a shelter place, I would definitely put it down, put it down on, on your CV. So these are the main important things to, to consider before you even um, uh, could think of applying to a program. That's all I have. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Hen, I would like to add something to this. Yeah, I was actually just going <laughs> to unmute myself for that. Um, I think uh, also, yeah, you know, uh, more than um, like you need, of course, the experience. A lot of it comes from uh, where you've worked, your recommendation letters, uh, what kind of experience you've got. And I think a large part of it is also your SOP. That's your statement of purpose. It's uh, basically um, an essay that you write on why you want to pursue that particular program or why you know you, know, you want to study this particular thing um so that's something that's also very important when you're applying uh, abroad because your recommendation letters and your sop also uh, plays a part in uh, you know whether you get the seat or not um your gpa really not so much just like everyone else said uh, really not not that big a deal but obviously you need the thing is the, the more practical experience you have uh, you know the the more the higher your chances are of uh, getting into a good uni thank you ma'am sorry i'm just uh, thinking about all our lab assistants are now going to come at to us saying like you know we're not able to do our jobs because now we have all these students <laughs> in the laboratory saying no 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 we're going to do everything <laughs> I'd, I'd like to add something, if I may. Yes, sir. Um, one of the things I also found, you know, you have a college magazine. And often one writes in these college magazines. And I, I know I would always contribute on a yearly basis to it. And these lay articles are, are, are very much a type of publication that a student would be doing. And so it, it lends uh, to your application from a point of your leadership, like Dr. Muzaffar has said is to show things that you would do that is different from the average student. So you need to stand out. And, and I found that in my initial years when I had not researched, I had not published, but uh, these articles that I had written, I put it down as my lay articles. And they did actually carry some weight. So it's something for kids to think about. I found late in life that I often did a number of uh, radio programs locally in one of our local st stations in Durban. And those carried a lot of weight because I was disseminating public information. And particularly, it illustrated the ability for me to translate what I learned in order to communicate this to the community. And that's essentially what we do. We are supposed to be communicators. So if you're a good communicator, whether you can write a letter, speak well, et cetera, you will get your point uh, through to whoever you are approaching. Thank you, sir. We can't hear you yet. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Hello? I just yeah. removed I just removed the headset. Okay. Next we go to the main part uh, about uh, getting scholarships. What are the scholar various scholarships for med student applying for the Applying to lessen their financial burdens, what they can do, how to get a self-funded master's program in abroad, and can you give the cost a uh, martial thing? I will start with Disham. You go. Oh, okay. Um, 
so going back, uh, as I said, I started uh, practicing in 2007 and only went on to do my master's in 2011. Um, and though I already got admission in 2010. And what I did at the time was since I didn't have a scholarship in hand, I deferred my admission. So that's basically saying to the university here, I pay you a little token fee, kindly save my seat for next year. What uh, that allowed me to do is explore the you know, various scholarships uh, that were out there. And also uh, in my experience and from the experience of uh, other people who'd been abroad um, at that point, uh, a lot of the scholarship agencies, they are willing to bet on someone that already has admission. Um, I'm not saying that they, they don't otherwise, um, but this was me. I, at that point, I was able to defer my admission, so that's what I did. I went to uh, various um, agencies saying, I have admission, I just need the money, help me do it. And uh, believe it or not, I have, from 2010, a list, three pages, both sides long. That, and these are all Indian scholarships, mind you. And I'll be very happy to share this, uh, uh, you know, with our uh, hosts uh, this evening. And uh, maybe some of them are still up and about. Maybe some of them have long said goodbye. But I'll do that for sure. The point being that that's when I started. I looked at, I, th I do remember, I looked more at Indian scholarships than I did at um, the ones in UK. I did look at them. I was, well, unfortunate enough to not get any. But what I did get was the uh, Jain Tata Endowment Scholarship. Uh, and along with that, I got an MK Tata Scholarship and one more Tata Scholarship. I, I shouldn't forget, but I did. Um, and the minute you get one scholarship, you can immediately say to another one saying, hey, I just, you know, these guys thought I was... Uh, you know, good enough for them to invest in, would you consider two? And that's how I went about. The minute I got one, I rewrote to everybody who had said no. And I got lucky with one of them and the others did not. Either way, I had three agencies that backed me eventually. And to do that, of course, you do need to present yourself. And I think that's true even for scholarships, which maybe in you know the country where you're looking at going, be it UK, US, um, Australia, or uh, in Europe somewhere, everybody wants to know what is it, what's different about you. And I think we kind of covered that in the previous uh, question that we were talking about, that what more do you add to your CV? Uh, what do you write in your SOP, as uh, Hena just pointed out? They want a complete package. They want to know why you, why they should give you the money that you, you know, either some scholarships like mine was an endowment. I took some time. I paid it back. And the others are a free, full free scholarship. Why they should do that. And I think it helps to kind of believe what you're doing as well. For me, it was wildlife medicine. I wanted to do something uh, with Indian wildlife. And I had some ideas about it, what I wanted to do and contribute to the wildlife of our country. And I think that's what got me uh, noticed uh, in, in the eyes of uh, the, these people. Um, I think in addition to that, there are a lot of scholarships which are available by the universities uh, where you might be going. And I think Muzaffar would be great to, to add to that. Uh, and as I said, all of this, I'm very happy to share. Uh, I think Malika or somebody, please uh, just remind me and I will share this with you, this document. Thanks. Definitely, ma'am. Thank Thanks you, for ma going through all the thing. Thank you. Is it okay if I may add a comment here? Up. Yes, sir. Yes, well, thanks. Uh, so I want to... I think Disha did cover uh, a great deal about Indian scholarships, but I want to cover what the outside universities have to offer. Again, from my experience, I have sort of, you know, limited knowledge with the, with all the universities that, that have scholarships, but I definitely know a few, uh, which I would be willing to share. I did my PhD from University of Warwick in, in UK. The reason being one paramount, was whether they offer whether or not they offer the scholarship. Warwick University, which tech, you know, is spelled as Warwick, 
but the pronunciation is Warwick, so just FYI. Um, they have a scholarship called the Chancellor's International Scholarship. What that scholarship does, that covers your full international tuition fee and the cost of living. So you are, whether, you know, PhD is typically in the UK are about four years or four, four and a half years most. So you are already covered for four years for your tuition. Then at the same time, per month, you're being given a certain amount of stipend over 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 a thousand pounds per month, which is sufficient for a graduate student to sustain in the UK um, and certainly, you know, um, live a good life. Um, I think uh, so. So that was my sort of, you know, the primary reason for applying to the University of Warwick. Also, at the same time, there's another university called University of Nottingham Veterinary School. So they have the uh, the scholarship called as Nottingham Research Excellence Scholarship. So these are the things what you should be looking at. And again, that scholarship gives you full international tuition fee, but it doesn't necessarily cover your cost of living. But for that, they do have an opportunity to for you to assist in the teaching assistantship programs. Like, for example, if you're a graduate student, you will be um, mentoring or sort of, you know, um, helping with with, with labs um, for undergraduate students or master's students. That's how you um, gain that additional sort of, you know, funds to, to cover your cost of living. University of Bristol Veterinary School, um, they have the scholarship called as Zuchi Smith Scholarship, and that's for Indian students. So so these are the top, you know, these are, these are well-reputed universities in the UK. They definitely offer scholarships, Cambridge University, Oxford University. They have their own scholarship programs, which I would highly encourage you. You should, internet is available. This information is not something that I gained in the UK. This is something I knew already back home. So Google is your, you know, um, is your resource. I would highly encourage you to look for scholarship opportunities in the UK. They're not necessarily external agencies, but university scholarships. And you, there will be a list of universities uh, with all the requirements. And um, within now moving on to the United States, there certainly are scholarships available, but they're not necessarily the chancellor has a fund for, you know, for students from India. Uh, there for the graduate programs like Dr. Singh and, you know, my other panelists, they already covered. You have to have um, a member of the staff or a faculty member accept you as a student. Of course, that applies everywhere. Um, and then you would go through their own scholarship process, you know, whether they fund your PhD. Mostly what I have seen in the U.S. is that once a graduate student, uh, a PhD student enrolls at a university, you are automatically enrolled in a, in a teaching assistantship sort of program. Most of the students, that's what they do. They teach the undergraduate and master's students, assist with the labs and, you know, um, with the course director, uh, they assist the course director, and that's how they the tuition fee is waived off. Um, but the UK is relatively different. You don't necessarily have to do any teaching assistantships. You can be awarded a scholarship based on your credentials, like we already covered, your SOP, what your interest is, and, um, you know, how your application packet is looking. I want to certainly add um, one important um, uh, thing here. When you when you're applying for any of the scholarship programs, it is really, really important to know if this, for example, I'll give you a scenario. If there is an outbreak of, I'll tell you my example, for example, foot rot in sheep. And that's where I work, that was my PhD. So UK has an 84 million pound loss to the country annually because of the disease foot rot in sheep. The sheep industry is big in, in, in England. Um, my master's research was based on development of a vaccine. That was the first vaccine, first master's research in India developing a foot rot vaccine. And then thinking that UK has a bigger problem, this really helped me obtain that scholarship because you are the person that is needed. The UK has a big problem of foot rot. They have a candidate who has already experienced in foot rot, who has worked on vaccine development. So it was it was really relatively you know, easier that way. For you to be able to recognize an institute and be able to be successful in your application is recognize what the emerging issues are. Know your interest. If you have background in that, great. 
if you don't have background but you have interest, you can still apply and and you know um, of course come up with an application packet and talk to the to the mentor what you're uh, what you're willing to do and what your um, what your future sort of you know direction is. If that's that's the sort of direction you would like to take it will be relatively easier. Again, emerging issues have more funding. Um, resources are there available. They need skill. They need to train people to be able to deliver in those situations. So I think that 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 covers most of what I have to say. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, yeah, the next question directed to Dr. Sunil. Uh, you had a career switch when you joined the masters in the US. Could you tell us about how and why you opted for research? Well, I, I think, as I earlier said, you cannot dictate what your future would be. So circumstances would dictate that. At that particular point, there were certain personal uh, circumstances that dictated what I was going to do. Uh, so I decided at that point that I needed to expand my realm of knowledge, and that's why I chose to do it a few years later. I also believe that it was important to acquire some experience before I decide to do a particular course or a particular uh, discipline that I would follow. So essentially, it was based on two things. Uh, firstly, in the early 80s, there were not as many opportunities as there were days now. Secondly, there was not enough funding. You know, money was a lot scarcer. Thirdly, it was about finding an area that you would be funded. So it was a combination of events. And I think as it's already been reiterated by all my colleagues here, each one's circumstances are different. And it's for you to take the best or grab the best opportunity available at that point in time. I'd just like to add something with regards to the scholarship and something that students need to think about. For instance, you may be familiar with the BRICS organization, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. So usually these emerging or developing nations have bilateral relations when it comes to development of science, technology, and industry. So it might be an area for students to look at uh, for possible, potential, sorry, potential funding. Uh, I know that uh, lots of research funding is often required that there must be bilateral uh, research from a research in India and South Africa researching on the same topic. So there might be needs for students that would involve both Indian and South African students. So those are some of the things you need to look at and also look at the United Nations. I was fortunate enough for my master's program to acquire United Nations scholarship which actually came very, very easily. Uh, somebody had mentioned it to me. All I did was write a letter. And the next thing I was told, yes, you have a scholarship of $750, which was quite a princely sum back in the 80s. I hope that answers most of the questions. Yes, sir, thank you. Hello, next I will go with Dr. Ina. Please do tell us about uh, the extra courses and internships and programs you undertaken that make, make you so qualified in veterinary exotics. Okay. Um, so, uh, like I said, you know, even before you apply for your master's, uh, you should, I, I worked at a clinic, but that was a small animal clinic. Uh, but of course, it gives you a lot of experience in uh, clinical practice, basically, you know, just how to handle animals uh, and things like that. And even while I was in Australia, um, so we were attached to an exotic animal hospital, which was right next to the uni. So, I mean, you just have to actually go in there and say, hey, can I uh, help out? Just like uh, even um, Dr. Muzaffar pointed out, hey, like, you know, I, can I just even do basic things? You, you learn from them, you observe them. Uh, you know, you get to learn a lot because and everyone's really open to teaching. So you just have to go there and ask them. Um, I volunteered at a wildlife rescue center, which, you know, I mean, along with your course, you can do a lot of things. You just have to get out there and do it. So at the wildlife rescue center, uh, you get so many birds, like the birds that are kept as pets here, like exotic pets are actually is actually the wildlife in Australia, like your cockatoos, um, your lorikeets, your corellas are um, are actually you know wild birds there 
um so and i did my uh, masters uh, project at perth zoo which is where i worked with all the wildlife there so over there as well um i you know i used to just ask they had a lot of cadavers so and they will give it to you if you want to practice on it so you, you know and the professors are more than willing to help you out with it so uh, you know we practiced on cadavers we practiced surgery etc so uh, that is something you just have to get out there and do it everyone is just willing to help you all you have to do is ask uh, and um, also a lot of uh, you know now there are uh, you know apart from just you know even going abroad and studying there are a lot of uh, universities even giving you online um, classes or online courses if you can't you know go abroad or even give it that much time so you know you do i i mean every year i'm doing at least three or four ces uh, so that my knowledge i mean i keep updating my knowledge uh, especially with exotics uh i mean i don't really uh, go for small animal ces really so it's just the exotic ces so you need to keep updating yourself otherwise um you know it can't be like you can't have a situation where you've learned everything about the subject that you're interested in so um i think uh, my advice would be to just uh, go out there ask them ask anybody uh, there are a lot of um universities that you can even email if you have doubts about whether this is the right course for you just email them they always reply and uh, they are very helpful um uh, so if you you know you have any doubts they'll help you with it uh, universities themselves also uh, provide scholarships but most of them are reserved for their local students uh, so uh, yeah but you could apply for that as well but yeah so uh, me working with exotics came back because i kind of just went out there i was uh, you know just working at different places so that i could get that experience even whether it was observership or i was actually hands on learning how to handle learning how to give injections learning how to do surgery so you just have to get out there and do it thank you ma'am um thank you ma'am thank you Okay, so the next question is how to go for a self-funded master's program abroad. Uh, how much will it cost? Like uh, the tuition, including tuition fees, the um, everything like stay, tuition fees, college fees, everything. Um, Doctor Disha. All right. So uh, to be honest, I don't think I can give you a figure because, of course, it has changed from the time that uh, I was there. But uh, of course, there's going to be a certain tuition fee that you're going to have to pay. Uh, what students will need to or young vets will need to do their homework uh, about is so one tuition fees. That's what you need. You pay to the college. Second is, uh, of course, your stay in, in UK. Uh, or wherever you're going, uh, you know, your uh, other living expensive, uh, expenses, your travel, your food. You need to do some homework about where you're going. Make some choices about why you're going, where you're going. And in the bigger picture, whether, you know, is it economical for you or not? Is it more economical for you to go to, say, UK? Or is it more economical for you to go to the US or to Australia or anywhere else? Um I, as I said, I was lucky enough to uh, get a scholarship <clears throat> uh, that covered uh, nearly 80% of the tuition fee. And so all I had to take care of my was my living arrangements as well as, of course, food and travel. Uh, luckily for me, well, luckily or not, it, mine was only a one-year course. So that is something else that you need to factor in. How long is the study program? Uh, if you're going for so I was going for only for one year so I had to plan only for one year I had x amount that had been given to me and I only had three or four other factors that I had to pay for um, was I able to do it yes and that finally went into saying yes I will go ahead and do this uh, if you decide to go for an integrated master's and PhD or just a master's a PhD how long is your master's for how long is your PhD for what state are you going to study uh, say, I think in Muzaffar might be able to tell better, but I think in the US, say, New York is supposed to be really expensive. Some other places are supposed to be a little bit, you know, uh, bearable compared to that. Um, again, you need to research the hell out of where you're going and justify to yourself why you're going, where you're going, and whether or not you're able to afford it. 
just to say that you've gone to a university, but at the end of it, uh, do remember that this is a huge expense on your pocket, on the pocket of your family. And you should be able to, you know, justify it. And of course, pay it back for sure. Uh, I know I did, and that allows me to sleep better at night. Um, and so if you're not able to get a scholarship, do you really want to do this? So these are some hard pressed questions that I would really, really tell you to ask yourself uh, before you even decide to jump into it both feet. Because mind you, uh, while I've come back to India <clears throat> voluntarily, uh, vol voluntarily uh, that is not the case with everyone. There are people who've done their master's or maybe a PhD, uh, but not uh, managed to secure a job. Um, in that case, that's all that money that you've put in and not been able to re you know, recover in the same currency as you've spent it in. Um, sorry, going back to what you asked, how much it would cost, uh, I, went, I went and did my uh, master's in 2011 and I'm very sure things have changed uh, greatly since then. And so, yeah, my advice would be look it up, but these are the considerations that you need to look at. And I would uh, request my fellow panelists that if I've missed out on something major that these students should know, please do help me out. Uh, yes, ma'am. Could Dr. Hena uh, uh, tell about this a bit more? Like, can you tell us if there's no scholarship, then how to go about and like, like about paying back the loan and stuff like that? Okay, so yeah, I uh, didn't, uh, I mean, I didn't get a scholarship. Uh, at that point, uh, there wasn't a scholarship available for, uh, for, for vets. Um, but yeah, I mean, but I was also lucky enough to have the support of my family as well. Um, also, what you can look at is there are a lot of banks, especially, uh, you know, now recently as well, there are a lot of student loans that are available. So all you have to do is do a little research, speak to, you need to speak to all the banks okay that are that are giving student loans for students to study abroad and honestly things have changed and um the point is also you have to decide whether you're going to come back or not um there's nothing wrong in doing either like whether like uh, uh, the same like dr disha i decided to come back to india because i wanted to i wanted to work here um but there are a lot of people who don't want to that's completely fine but then you have to, uh, you know, decide whether it's uh, whether it's uh, enough for you, like you're earning enough to stay there as well as you're earning enough to pay back your loan. Um, so, yeah, these are some of the things that you need to keep in mind. Uh, living in Australia is uh, I'm not going to say it's cheap, uh, but it might be a little cheaper than the US for sure. Um, yeah and uh, i think uh, i was actually just looking up at the current fees that i mean they they have gone up since i was there so it, it i mean i think it's around 40 or fifty thousand dollars now for the course that i did so um if you're willing to um you know if you're even, even getting a loan or if you know your your family is willing to support you but make sure that you earn that back um you know by by doing a lot of meaningful work for yourself. Thank you, ma'am. Manoj. Um, I... Thank you. So, Dr. Musafa, can you say about the admission procedure in Canada? Canada. Oh. Is it same or is it different? It was a... Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I'll try to be precise as possible. So um, Canada and the United States, they pretty much, you know, have the same requirements. Like I said, for clinical um, clinical practice, there may be some Canadian local like, you know, state exams. But again, the broad, the big picture is those state exams have the, the curriculum or the background is jurisprudence and the, the clinical, if you are licensed to practice veterinary medicine in the United States, you have passed the NAVLI and ECFEG process, you're good to go in Canada. So there's not much variation in, in between Canada and US in terms of practicing veterinary medicine. Okay, sir. Just a moment.
what are uh, what were your experiences with choosing the appropriate course and university for your master's program abroad dr sanil as has already been mentioned there are innumerable universities in the united states and you may not be able to procure admission to maybe your chosen university and fortunately for me Illinois was one of the universities besides Texas A&M that I had applied to and Illinois was the first to reply so Illinois was what I took so it was a matter of much of a muchness rather than uh, being specific about it and it's about being uh, ready to grab whatever opportunity comes by um, I guess it, it meant um, like how should we screen colleges like on what basis uh, a student can pick this college like i guess that's what the question is well i think okay so in that case it depends what your area of interest would be certain universities colleges researchers might be known for a particular area of work so this is the way you have to research it uh, if your particular interest is wildlife then you obviously need to research those people that might be leaders in their area or what i found is like in the case of what dr muzaffar said you might attend courses or you might attend lectures that you meet people and they might be able to give you leads of uh, how you might be able to satisfy your interest or the area that you'd like to apply so i think it's not scripted you know in stone you have to be uh dexterous about it you have to be uh, think on your feet uh and grab the opportunity you know for instance you might want to uh do clinical medicine but there's no opportunity in it uh but you do have an opportunity in say veterinary physiology and you can actually accept that admission and tailor your research towards a clinical aspect and that's how fit your necessary needs If I may add a little comment here, if that's okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. So, like Dr. Singh was saying, I just you know want to reiterate a little bit. Um, you, if you are, say for example, the university, you know, this university has a big research focus on um, in the area that you're interested in. However, I, what I would highly recommend doing is, each university has a list of faculty members. They have, they have their own web page. They have their own research interests put out there. What I would suggest, you can go on that that, that particular university web page, uh, like look for the faculty members. What I did typically, you know, when I was back in India, you, you explore the research focus of each faculty member, and if somebody that you that interests you, that somebody's research, some faculty member's research interests you, that is your best bet. You know their interest, interest, your interest match. I would highly suggest doing that because that helps a long way. Because if you have a common goal, if you have a common mission, if you have common interest, that certainly makes it a lot easier. So, so go ahead and you know research faculty pages, university faculty pages, and and go and look at their interest and see if something is that what you what you may be interested in doing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. What are the jobs we'll be offering in India when we come back after our abroad studies, Dr. Reena? Um, what are the jobs? So, uh, yeah. So uh, job opportunities are honestly plenty uh, in India. It de really depends on which field you want to work in. Uh, if you want to work uh, purely in wildlife, um, you have wildlife NGOs that you can apply to. Um, there, uh, I mean, you can also apply to the forest department again, uh, but there are different exams in India to give as well to work with uh, the government. Um, uh, you can always work in private practice, uh, like me, which uh, I I worked at other clinics clinics before I uh, decided that I wanted my exclusive uh, exotic animal practice. Um, uh, so that is a decision I came to after working at se uh, at several clinics. 
and uh, decided that this uh, i mean I, I i wanted to kind of specialize in in my particular field um so yes private practice is an option there are now especially in mumbai we have a lot of clinics a lot of clinicians working with um exotics and wildlife um so that is something that is uh, a, a a job uh, to consider um uh um yeah and i mean other jobs i i can't really say much about i mean you could also yes there are zoos of course that you can apply to uh, it's always great if you have a masters in wildlife obviously it it's good uh, if you work at the zoo uh, where you have that kind of expertise um there i i did uh, i was about to, uh, so this is my personal story. Uh, I was about to work at the zoo, but again, you have to be prepared for uh, a lot of uh, politics whenever it comes to uh, working with the local government or uh, the central government. Uh, there are certain issues, uh, which is why uh, I also primarily chose to uh, work privately and do my bit by myself. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so next question is, could you tell us about the veterinary licensing exams in your country? What are the things to consider while applying for a job in a private clinic abroad? Dr. Sanil? As registration with the Royal College, then you will be given reciprocity, no questions asked. You can come straight into practice. If you choose to come uh, from India, like in the case of, uh, in my case, and many of the other colleagues that graduated in India, uh, you have to write the board exam. It's two parts, essentially. It's not as complicated as the American system. Uh, if you have a degree that's uh, a four and a half, five year degree that's recognized, you need to apply for two things in particular. You need to apply to an organization called SAKWA. SAKWA is the South African Quality Assurance uh, Institute, where they will look at your degree and evaluate it to the equivalent of the South African qualification. If it's seen as equivalent, uh, then you can prepare to write the exam. Um, the exam obviously is very similar to the lines that most exams world over take, which is generally multiple choice, computer based. And once you pass that exam, then you are subjected to about three days of practical examinations, which would include examination of animals, performing basic surgery, etc. Uh, of recent, students are quite successful because we have a barrage of students from the rest of Africa coming to South Africa to do the exam, particularly Zimbabwe. Uh, we have the Congo, a lot of these wars. Uh, strife areas and, and political strife areas coming to South Africa to write the exams. And the pass rate has been pretty good. It's been, you know, well over 70%. Uh, the institute does give you access to exam papers, etc., etc. So it allows you to prepare. And it's a fairly realistic exam. Uh, when I compare it to exams that are offered by uh, other institutes around the world, it, it's a lot more practical. Unlike the exams that we had to write about 30, 25 to 30 years ago, which was uh, a bit unrealistic, uh, some really silly questions, and the intention was to trap you. That paradigm has changed. So, yeah, it's it's not difficult. The process is available. The organization you need to contact is the South African Veterinary Council. Uh, they have a web page, and all the information is available there. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Nusaf, would you like to add to this question as well? Yes, yes. As I covered, I'll, I'll try to be, you know, um, I'll limit my answer to just a few sentences. I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, for the United States, you would certainly need to take NAVLI. And I was actually reading one of the comments from, from one of the students. They say, for non-clinical subjects, you wouldn't need to take NAVLI. And I agree, certainly. Uh, I did specify in my previous comment that if you're interested in clinical practice, I just want to reiterate that again. Clinical practice would require you to take the North American Veterinary Licensing Exam. For Indian graduates to be able to recognize their degree, you have to go through the Education Commission for Foreign Veterinary Graduate Process, which I already explained. And after that, there's a North American Veterinary Licensing Exam. After that, if you want to practice in a specific state, 
But in New York or California, I was in California, but you know, so Texas, you would have to have a state specific license. Again, for, um, mm -hmm. for non-clinical subjects, you will not be able to practice. Certainly you will be able to obtain training, advanced training, but not necessarily you can, you're eligible to practice. I hope that answers the question. Yes, sir. Let's get into some fun part of our discussion. What are the fun experience that you had? Any new slags that you are found in your abroad studies? Disham. Uh, sorry, Manoj, could you say the new what? Any fun experience or any fun slags you got there? Oh, fun. Everything was absolutely uh, fun. I mean, I, I think I mentioned it twice uh, before already. Um, uh, the, the whole cultural experience, I think that is something that you kind of also need to be prepared for. Of course, I think television these days kind of prepares us for a whole lot of it. But to be there and experience is uh, something else. Say hello to my cat. Um, uh, also... Uh, I think the whole, uh, so I was in London City and, uh, you know, experiencing the nightlife over there and walking in Camden. And uh, I think what, I, what really stands out is, uh, so in uh, in Camden, Camden Lock, there would be markets. And uh, this one place would do Indian rolls. Like, you know, we get here like Frankie's. I think a lot of Bombay people might identify with it. And that guy used to sell rolls. And that was something that... Uh, yeah, made it really memorable. You realize how homesick you can get. So, hey, if you're prepared to be homesick, go for it. I know I did get for some time, even though I ended up marrying and, you know, having my base out of UK now. But, uh, yeah, that was that was something that uh, I think I really treasure the time I spent with the whole lot of different people and the different cultures I got uh, over there. I hope I answered the question. Yes. Yeah. I would like to, go. I would like to tell about the new slang that you learned over there. That's different from normal English that we normally speak here. No? Okay. <laughs> then I guess I'll go back to <laughs> asking you a question. I think people are very well behaved with us, uh, you know, in, in, in UK maybe especially. Uh, it's only now, I think it's after my college and uh, as more and more friends that I've uh, made over there that, you know, we can pull each other's legs and, you know, uh, to be the brown girl and uh, all of the Goras over there. Like that's <laughs> something. But uh, no, I think people were very polite in that sense. And no slang that, you know, we, we didn't enjoy. For, for that matter. Now, I had a really brilliant experience like that. If I may add, you know, just a little bit, just a one minute sentence there. Um, my, since I've, you know, I've, I've traveled to Australia, United States and the UK and overall the experience has been, you know, terrific and it's, it's amazing. You meet a lot of people. One thing I want to, the reason I wanted to speak here is a lot of, you know, I've heard people, you know, saying that, oh, do they recognize your culture? Do they respect your culture? Maybe you have a different religious background. How does that work in a Western country? Trust me, every Westerner would respect your ethics, your morale, your, your culture, your religion. Um, you know, a lot of people have restrictions of, you know, um, doing one thing or the other. Everybody respects you. So for me, definitely it was a great experience knowing the culture, knowing other people, getting to make friends with them, and actually sharing some of the common things that we have, you know, um, uh, things that we have in common or learning about the other culture. And they like to learn about your culture as much as you like to learn about their culture. So certainly it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, um, uh, it's a ballot one of, you know, it's a, it's a thing that you, you would encounter going in as a fresh student. You may have some challenges. Uh, to to get up to speed with the culture thing, but after like six months, I would give it six months to know uh, the basics, and and after that, you are all set to go. But overall, it's been a fantastic experience. Um, a lot of respect, a lot of love. You know, um, probably which I probably wouldn't have received back home with respect to you know the way our veterinary education is, the way the students are being dealt um, or treated. Um, not necessarily in a bad way. I don't mean to say that. I meant to say our system of education is relatively different than um, the system of education in the Western countries. So, so, so overall, it's been fantastic for me. Okay, sir. Okay, the so next question directed to Dr. Sanil. 
so how did you join for a marketing management course in south africa soon after you finished your undergraduate <laughs> you know my my family is a, uh, was a business family because my dad uh, is late of course now and i do did, did grow up in a business family so i had a period of when i was doing nothing particularly i you know having studied veterinary sciences and you know it been a semester program and the number of tests and exams you write you almost have a withdrawal when you're doing nothing and you are relaxing a lot so i decided well why not let's do this marketing course because uh, clearly one of the things that we are not taught in veterinary school is uh, you not taught business and business is fundamental to you running a successful practice so the marketing course was available and i thought it was suited me excellently uh, i learned a lot of things by doing this marketing course which actually did benefit me later in life and uh, actually other business courses that i've did uh, which allows me to also educate students that uh, come and serve the Uh, so me at my practice uh, to make them more aware of how you run a well-rounded practice, and it's not about academics all the time. It's about looking at the practical aspects of running a business. Thank you. Extensive large animal wildlife practices in Australia. What are the various other scopes for vets in Australia, ma'am? Doctor, uh, I'm so I'm sorry. Can you repeat that question? Owing to the extensive large animal wildlife practices in Australia, what are the various scopes available for vets in Australia? Uh, look, if you actually want to do practice, you will have to give uh, the national board exam there. uh whether it's large animal or wildlife so i mean if you if you're willing to give that exam and get certified there there's a huge scope uh to work um with wildlife as well as um large animals so um i mean it, it, it there's a, there's a great scope scope i don't think there's any issues they have a lot of um uh exotic animal clinics as well um you know private practices as well that are doing a lot of work but uh, they also do a lot of work in uh, wildlife research um so that is something uh, there's zoos have a lot of breeding programs um uh, if you're willing if you want to do something research based again uh, that is something that you can pursue there um yeah so i mean the scope is great there's uh, there's nothing but nothing but if you really want to if you want to practice yes you'll have to give the qualifying exam Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, did you go through a cultural shock when you went abroad? Is there any discrimination against Indian students at the universities abroad? No. I think I think out of everybody, I'm the most uh, recent uh, uh, graduate. I think from a university abroad, and uh, what I can say is, uh, I honestly didn't. face uh, any racism because there's just so much diversity and diversity is something that um, most universities are promoting right now so you know even on the basis sometimes of uh, being brown uh, or being from a different culture is something that sets you apart and also you know maybe gives you an advantage of getting into a good uni as well uh, you know if if obviously if you have the right qualifications to do so So but yeah no it I I personally didn't face any uh, racism Okay uh, anybody else want to talk about it No okay okay so Dr. I guess Dr Singh has to say something I think Dr Singh has to say something go yeah. ahead sir I think a lot has changed uh, if I go back 30 years I think we we were not a global village Uh, there were a number of uh, issues that say people didn't understand completely um you know and and there were some cultural biases etc etc i think the world has changed tremendously i think uh, the media has made us more aware of things globally uh, i can clearly tell you when i traveled to the states the first time people thoroughly confused who i was you know some people thought i was hispanic uh sometimes i've spoken to in spanish uh if i said to people i was from africa i was born in africa the other question would be asked but you don't look african 
you know, they didn't understand the issue of ethnicity. They did not understand what was race, uh, sometimes language, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think that has changed. Uh, also, you'd find that uh, to give you a, a very good incident, uh, I remember when I was uh, a student in Illinois, and uh, CN, CNN CNN uh, aired a story on a particular temple in Rajasthan that was ridden with rats. Uh, and you know, obviously, the way media has put it. It was seen in a particular way. So I was asked that question and I said, well, listen, I'm, I'm South African by birth, but I'm Indian by heritage. But what's the difference between people worshipping something that's alive as akin to somebody worshipping Mickey Mouse? You know, you choose whether you want to uh, glorify creation in its real form or you want to glorify it in its animated form. Uh, but clearly, uh, my stay in the States was good and I agree with Musafra, the attitude of especially the academics. And if I had to find a problem, I had less problems with Americans than I had with Indian academics. And really, when I chose my, my, my supervisor, I made sure he wasn't Indian because if he had a hard time, he thought he had to give me a hard time. And that's what I experienced. But yes, when he talks about Westerners, I think they're more open-minded. They can be a little narrow-minded at the outset, but when you can put things across logically and ethically, uh, it's accepted. Also, if I could quickly add something here. Remember, I think most of us have been very lucky. Like We haven't faced racism, racism, and the terms that you know, I think we're asking here. The most racist comment I got was like, you can speak good English. And I'm like, hell yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everybody expects you to sound like Apu from Simpsons, like, you know, with a whole head shake. But, you know, not, not everyone's like that. But we're also lucky, as you said, that, you know, we're, we're now truly a global village. If you do face racism somewhere, it's easy to voice it. There are, you know, there are the people in your universities, in your colleges that you can approach and say, hey, this is a problem that I'm facing and you can address it you don't have to suffer it as you know probably our predecessors in other uh, in a day and time did so don't let that bog you down at all just go for it if you must thanks thank you i put this question for all the four of you can you say uh, which field is emerging in veterinary science uh, any form Dr. Musafar, which field is emerging in our veterinary science? These are em which will well, be a very, great emerging. Yes, well, thanks. I think it's a it's a very broad question, and I would I would only answer it in my the 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 in my within my area of expertise. Um, certainly, you know, COVID nineteen again, it's it's affecting humans, it's affecting animals. So. Department of Virology, like people who are more like research, like microbiologists or virologists, uh, you know, bacteriologists, there's always diseases coming up. So that's something that would never stop. You know, that field is always open and up for challenges in for more research. Again, clinical practice, there's always scope. You know, uh, that would answer one of the comments that people meet. What are the opportunities? You know, clinical practice is always rewarding. Diseases come. There's no way an animal cannot get sick, and you won't see a patient. So um, those are some of the things. You know, practice is always there. Um, emerging issues like that are coming. You can go on CDC's website, Center for Disease Control and Prevention. They have the most updated list of diseases that are up, emerging issues that are up. You could always um, go on the WHO website, World Health Organization, and that will give you like the most sort of you know recent outbreaks, recent diseases, and things like that. Climate change is, you know, big thing. And so um, veterinarians in general, we are versatile. We are not necessarily trained in one aspect. We have a very broad scope, um, whether it's a, a conservationist to a, um, a wildlife, uh, you know, veterinarian to a clinical practicing veterinarian, to a researcher, to a public health veterinarian, to an administrator and, you know, all sorts of things. And I think it again depends on what you are interested in, but just to focus on emerging issues, I would highly suggest that you go on the CDC's website, WHO, and again, you know, micro Department of Microbiology would be your focus if you're looking research-wise um, to to build your career. 
Right. So anybody wants to add something to that? Um, yeah, I think uh, yeah. Mahatma very rightly pointed out, uh, uh, sum summarizing, like, it's all connected. It's all connected to each other. So if you were to ask me, if I was to answer first, I would have said, hey, wildlife medicine or, you know, conservation of wildlife is something that's important. Now, immediately that connects to, you know, as he said, emerging diseases, you know, that's a wild animal over there, virology, bacteriology, you name it. Um, One Health, I think if you look up, uh, you know, One Health, it, you know, there's so much out there that you can do. If you are interested, you can connect what you're doing right now to anything else that you think you possibly want to do and pursue. That is the scope that is, you know, open out there today. So don't let anything limit you. That, that is my suggestion to you. Uh, go for it. There are ways of connecting the dots. Uh, and it's nice. So just like today, you have four panelists over here. Ask the questions to the right people and you'll get the right answer. And you can just move from one to the other. If you're somebody like me who says, I want to try everything, you can still go ahead and do that. Much like Dr. Sanil uh, as well. You can achieve each and everything if you set out for it and you try and you know chalk it out for yourself. Thanks. As I rightly said, we are really happy to have all four of you all here then. <laughs> we have all four views. So I guess we can start with the questions that our viewers have sent. So first question is, uh, most certificates are in regional language and the US colleges require English translation. What can we do about that? Yes, if I'm able to answer this question, that's, that's right. There are, they call it education credential evaluators. There's a company based out of New York. When I had to submit my transcripts, of course I did my education in English. But still, our OGPA system, the CGPA system, was out of 10 scale. Here in the US, it's out of four point scale. So I had to submit all my credentials to the organization in the US. They're called as Education Credential Evaluator. So you pay about $100 um, fees, and then you submit all your translate transcripts and your degree and whatever is required. And they will provide you a, an output file. It's a translated product like a, a file of your transcripts. Um, and that's comparable to the US transcripts, essentially. So yes, if you have um, your, what they what they typically say, if your language is not, if your education is not in English, you would have to, in your country of origin, you would have to convert that into an English system and just translate it to English. You, you're not doing necessarily much, except that having somebody to translate that into English and then submit those to the education credential evaluator. So there are other multiple agencies that do, um, you know, translation. So I would just Google out, look up and, and just, um, but that's that's mainly the, the route. You would submit your documentation to them and they would, they would compare it and convert it to the US system of transcripts. Thank you, sir. And there are uh, whether there are uh, any volunteer activities that uh, research activities that a uh, Indian student can join in abroad in West. Uh, I think I'll reread the question. Uh, hold on. So someone has said that I have read about uh, even high schoolers getting to work on research programs in the West, thus adding to their resume. Are there any such volunteering and research opportunities for West students here in India? Um, so if I can quickly answer that, I do remember, I know I didn't do it myself, but I do remember uh, some of my uh, batchmates that, so as, as our seniors were conduct, you know, doing their whatever, uh, the thesis, either PhD or master's uh, dissertation, uh, they would volunteer and help out. So uh, again, it's a matter of asking if you tell a senior, um, you know, or a professor for that matter, I'm interested in what you're working on and could I help you in some way? Trust me, they're not going to say no because, you know, they have a helping hand and what you're doing by that is gaining some experience. So it's really, really just a matter of asking. Just go ahead and ask and not just to veterinary medicine. I think overall in life, just ask, what's the worst that can happen? Somebody will say no. 
but the other 50% chances that they'll say yes. So um, there are plenty of opportunities if you seek them out. And I encourage you to do that. Thanks. OK, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, next question. Could you all enlighten us about part-time jobs there? Uh, would this be in our where we're working? So for me, it would be UK, right? Uh, so as, yes. as, as a student. Uh, yes, again, uh, and I would bring it down to, so since I was doing a one-year course, I chose against doing a part-time job because my uh, curriculum was already, my schedule was already quite hectic. Uh, but people, if you go for uh, a course which is uh, longer and allows you enough time, then yes, I mean, you can either get uh, certain jobs which are on campus, so, you know, uh, or for that matter, nobody's stopping you from working in a McDonald's over there. So yes, there are plenty of opportunities. Anybody else would like to add to this? I think um, part-time jobs wise, yeah, I mean, if uh, you have the time uh, with your uh, schedule, with your classes, uh, I mean, you can do uh, pretty much anything from, uh, you know, you are working at McDonald's or at a supermarket. It really depends on uh, what you want to do. I mean, um, so and there are uh, also so in um, in Perth where I was there was there were certain vet clinics that would uh, kind of let you work as an assistant there. Um, but again, also if you're going to work, there are certain um, laws also that come into play. You'd have to pay taxes, so you have to get a tax number and things like that. So uh, you'd have to look into that before you start. If I may just quickly add here, um, there are certainly some opportunities on campus so you know uh, certainly you know my pen other panelists they covered off campus uh, part-time jobs but for example if you want to work on campus there's like library jobs library stewards you just have to be there um, and you know take care of that stuff people will just check in check out just keep a track of that and things like that so library stewards you have on-campus um, job opportunity there's a list of actually you know, it's interesting the way, I, and I was expecting these questions because we don't have those opportunities back in back in India. In, in universities abroad, it's a whole new ordeal. It's a completely new system. You would have, you know, job opportunities available for students to mentor, to teach, you know, to guide and be university stewards, help volunteer days. You know, there is um, there's days when prospective students visit the university. It's not necessarily, hey, I'm going to apply here. They bring their families. They see what the campus is like. Are we going to be in a good mental health? You know, how is it like? So you can help those days. And there is tons of, trust me, it is a, there is tons of opportunities available if you want to go that route. Again, if, you're, um, if your curriculum permits, you can certainly find a, a part-time job. Dr. Muzaffar, could you please say about uh, the residency program in yours? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question for me, I think, because I've done a residency last year, just completed my residency. Residency pro so residency essentially means it's a, a, a technically a master's degree. It's, they call it, it's a training. It's a three to four year, depending on what you choose. If you want to be a large animal veterinarian, minimum residencies are, are, are two, if you want to go a clinical residency, oh, sorry, um, not a clinical, I apologize. Residency in clinical microbiology, for example. What that means, you would be able to read the test results, demonstrate, and you know, be able to, to, to sign off those and be able to, to recognize what pathogen it is, what, you know, um, uh, identify the organism and provide your diagnosis uh, for, from a culture and things like that. So those programs are typically two years, non-clinical residencies. However, if you want to step into a clinical residency program like I did, Livestock, Herd Health and Reproduction, it was a three-year program at the University of California, Davis. We had a lot of you know, extensive uh, clinical uh, training. Of course, you get a lot of experience with respect to hands-on. So it's all hands-on. The, the expectation is after you have graduated from a residency program, 
you are ready to practice or you're ready to go as a as a faculty member. You should be able to train another resident um, in, uh, in, in the, within that in that program. Um, some programs like radiology residency is a four year program. So depending on what you choose, but essentially what residency is, it's like an advanced clinical training. We do, for example, MVSC in surgery and radiology in, in India. That is typically a residency program. So you are having advanced training in that particular field. They don't necessarily call it a master's here, but it's a, it's a called a residency program. And that's what it typically is. It's a hardcore training. You will be on clinic. Um, you definitely get some off clinic time where you do your research and all that. There's always research pro uh, uh, projects associated with the residency program. So the goal is to get to give you the broad experience in that particular field for you to be able to practice as a specialist. And I would want to add here, after you have um, completed your residency program, there is Ameri in the United States has different colleges. We call it American College of uh, veterinary surgery, American College of Large Animal or Internal Medicine. For me, when I completed my residency, I had opportunity to be boarded and become a diplomate of the American College of two. Two basically was two colleges. One is American College of Theriogology, which is mainly the reproduction, um, and American College of Preventive Veterinary Medicine, because my residency program was an integrated residency and a master's program, which enabled me to do a preventive medicine master's and become the diplomate of the American College of Veterinary, medicine, veterinary Preventive Medicine. So, um, so that's typically what residencies are, essentially. Would anybody else like to continue with this question? Dr. Sanal? No, I think uh, my colleague has covered it very well and sufficiently. It's essentially the same all over the world, except in South Africa, we award what we call the M Med Vet. That's what we call it in the, in, in the United States. I mean, in India, you call it the MVSC. Uh, in the UK, it has different names depending on the college you go to. So, yes, everything's been answered. Nothing more to add. Okay, sir. Uh, is it necessary to do uh, MVSC for practicing as a vet surgeon in abroad? Sorry. Oh, is, was somebody talking? So is it necessary to do MVSC for pra practicing as a wet surgeon in abroad? Anybody can go. Words to go. Sorry, Disha, go ahead. Sorry. No, 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 go on. OK, well, I'll just be very brief. It is not necessary to answer your question. Um, again, to be able to become a veterinarian in practice, you have to have a residency uh, if you want to do a specialty practice. But if you want to simply be a general practitioner in, uh, in the United States, what you need to do, you need to certify, do the certifying exams, ECFEG, NAVLI, and your state licensing exam, you're good to go. As long as you can pass those exams, MVSC is not absolutely not required. Right. Yeah, I think that would be the same for uh, the UK as far as my experience has been. You, as long as you clear your oh. uh, licensing examinations, you're good to go. Okay. I think the other thing is just to clarify, is just to clarify recogni recognition is not given from country to country. It's given from college. Uh, various colleges are recognized by the licensing institute of that country. Now, to just give you an example, in South Africa, if you graduated from the University of Pretoria or the Veterinary Institute at Ondestapur, they have direct reciprocity with New Zealand, Australia, and the UK. So a person who leaves South Africa can go and work in those countries directly. Uh, now, in the case of India, I think in the old days, BBC was set up at the Royal College. Uh, and so there was some reciprocity. But I think when India became independent, they chose not to have the reciprocity because it involves money, it involves a whole host of other things that are really uh, administrative and political rather than the quality of the education. Dr. Hena, you wanted to say something? Uh, no, I think uh, I think everyone's pretty much covered it. Um, you have to uh, obviously give your uh, licensing exam to practice any kind of uh, 
you know, clinical field. I think we've already spoken about it at great length uh, before as well. So I think we're good. Right. Mm, Manoj. Um, okay, I'll only ask. Oh, yeah, there. Is there any, is, a, is an applicant can get uh, rejected based on their SOP? I would like to say yes. Mind you, uh, so, you know, here we're face to face, uh, what a face to face interview does, right? Uh, an SOP is that, but it's not face to face. You're selling yourself in your statement of purpose. Um, and if they read that and decide that they, you know, don't really think much of this person, then yes you can very well get rejected on that, which is why um, you might, you know, if you do a bit of research uh, on, on the internet, you'll find there are people who will professionally help you write an SOP because this is the very first impression, which is not your degree certificate, your, you know, other degrees on a piece of paper that have been handed to you, but this is you presenting yourself. So one has to be really, really careful about uh, what they are presenting, how they're presenting themselves. Anyone uh, want to add? I, want to talk. I think SOPs are, are really, really important. Um, I mean, it, it is, it's, it's you putting yourself out there and that is really, they want to know the person that's going to join their university. Um, I mean, numbers are, I mean, that's something that's completely different. I mean, you could, uh, you know, be one of their best students without a great GPA, you know, because it's something that you love doing. So, yeah, I think and uh, what I also want to add is, yes, there are plenty of uh, people who are writing SOPs as a business, uh, but obviously they won't be able to add that personal touch. So, I mean, I would obviously suggest uh, writing it yourself, putting yourself onto that paper, but obviously then getting it maybe edited or corrected for any errors or getting it proofread by someone who maybe does it professionally. But uh, let that be your thoughts. Yes, I would say, yeah, I definitely um, want to vouch for that. Make sure whatever you put on your SOP is true representation of your interest because you can put, you know, it's, it's, nobody is watching. You can put whatever you like. However, if you get into the program and that interest doesn't reflect really in your practical life, it's going to truly reflect bad on you. And, and that doesn't go a long way. Um, I have, you know, I've seen folks struggling a lot they put something on their application and then, you know, typically they didn't, it didn't go well. So um, I would highly recommend if you, if you know your interest, you can certainly, I know English sometimes is a barrier because it's not our first language. Uh, be sure to consult in terms of proofreading and things like that, but make sure whatever you put out there, it should be true representation of you, you, what you want to do. And actually it should reflect, you know, you can't say from small animal, internal medicine to wildlife conservation there i mean again there is you can fill those dots but typically they want to see a person if for in my case i already had a focus always had a focus on livestock sheep goats cattle you know all of that in kashmir i worked and made my master's project was you know importantly uh, foot rot and sheep in uk i worked on dicylobacter nodosus again foot rot and sheep and so in residency, clinical residency, it was livestock herd health. So that involves sheep, goats. But now I wanted to gain some more clinical experience than actually having just only the research experience. So I wanted to broaden my, my horizons there. Um, have a single focus that helps a long way. Again, if that's not a thing, that doesn't mean you will not succeed in your life. To be able to, for, for you to be able to be successful in your efforts, you need to have a focus. And as long as you have that and you can justify why you did what you did, it's going to definitely work out. Right. Uh, anybody wants to add something else to this? I think what SOPs do is, that, you know, you, you represent, it's the representation of your conviction. Right. So as Muzaffar just said, that, you know, if you know what you want to do or for that matter, if you have 
a vague sense of idea where you want to go and why you want to do it and how you want to do it and what help you want to take. Let that be, let that SOP be a true representation of where you're coming from. Uh, people reading those SOPs, they understand, they know you are not already there. You are, you want, you are on your way there. And they understand that you have a lot of, uh, you know, unanswered questions, and and that's exactly why you're you're going for the degree that you're going for. But as uh, again, Ms. Afar already rightly pointed out that you know when you are in that situation and you, and they realize that you know what you've actually put down has nothing to do with what you're doing. It's all for naught. Um, so so yes, don't do something or don't don't think you need to go abroad and study uh, just for the sake of it. Justify it to yourself, justify it to your family, justify it to your future, and then take that step. And trust me, I think that leaves a like you know lesser scope for uh, for big mistake there. Then, yeah. right now, um, Dr. Sanyo, you want to add something to this? I think everything has been uh, addressed quite succinctly. Okay. So what about careers in research and industry after having a PhD from abroad and having a master's or PhD from India and what opportunities abroad? Anybody can go. I'm trying to find the question uh, myself, though it's, it's a research oriented question. So I'm sorry, I should leave it because I've more into clinical or uh, hands-on practice, uh, much like Hannah here. I'll go. Uh, what was the question? Can you repeat, Malika? Okay. Yes, what about careers in research and industry after having PhD from abroad and having a master's or PhD from India and opportunities abroad? Okay. Well, okay. Let me. There's two different questions. Very broad. So if I, if I, you know, if I, if I may answer the first part that what about uh, research opportunities after you pursue your degrees abroad, like PhD and things like that. First of all, after you've graduated from a PhD program, I would not expect getting a job right away as a faculty member, which typically happens in India. In the Western you know, world, it's, it's not the case. You have to do a postdoctoral fellowship. And I did that for a year, actually, after I graduated from my PhD program at the same university. Once you do your your um, postdoctoral fellowship, it's there's sometimes it's two years, sometimes it's three years. You want to be able to demonstrate because now you have chosen a path as a researcher. You want to establish your career as a faculty member or research or in a research setting. Um, the expectation there is you will be able to publish. You should be able to, um, of course, you know, uh, publish in peer-reviewed journals. Of course, be able to write grants. Of course, be able to uh, mentor people. So imagine your mentor who supervises your PhD. You should be able to do that. Um, again, there are in research setting. Again, there are opportunities. Universities have limited funding. Sometimes you will have you will have to apply for grant money from from National Institute of Health, for example, and or BBSRC in the UK. Once you are in a faculty or you are in that be a postdoctoral scholarship. Um, a fellowship program, uh, you would have to start writing grant applications to seek funding. Um, universities may not necessarily support your, your salary full time. And um, so that's with respect to immediately after your PhD is a postdoctoral fellowship and, and then applying for universities for a faculty position. Uh, going to industry, I have had my colleagues and really good friends who graduated from Warwick with me and they uh, went to do industry jobs. For example, in a laboratory, you are um, being appointed as a research scientist or you know, um, of some sort, but it's mainly like, you know, mainly diagnostic labs where you necessarily do not need to do any further research. It's great if you can, but it's mainly that, you know, samples are coming in, you are testing, you are providing your diagnosis, you're providing your identification and sending it to the hospital, sending it to the clinician who submitted the sample. Um, of course, those are there are many opportunities like that, and it's a lot of people. Uh, you know, I've seen multiple folks because it's a lot stress free. You have a salary that comes in, and you know you have a you have a, but it's only a limited sort of scope there because you're only doing one job, and maybe diagnosis is your technically the main deal, and um, you can certainly 
do research in a field that you want to develop diagnostic tests. If you have that um, knack, uh, develop a new PCR for something that hasn't been like Mycobacter Yoni's disease, you know, um, get an effective diagnostic tool and, you know, examples like that. But eventually, um, so that's sort of main, you know, uh, if you graduate from US and UK, uh, those are your next steps. However, if you have a master's and PhD from India, again, there is there's opportunities available that doesn't necessarily exclude you from the application process. I had friends who did PhD in India, actually, and then went to the UK as a postdoctoral fellow. Remember this, postdoctoral fellowship program, it's not a degree. It's a, you're being hired on a specific grant project. So if I was a PI, principal investigator, I have a grant application, for example, or, or a million dollar. I would need to hire a postdoctoral fellow to be able to do that research in the lab, to be able to conduct, you know, progress in um, that, that project. Um, so that's where we hire people uh, for 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 conducting research, but at the same time, you are getting training and experience in b being with that with that mentor, being with that principal investigator to to broaden your skill set and and to to be able to write grants and all of that. So you learn a lot during your postdoctoral fellowship, but at the same time, you're also delivering a lot. So um, again, doing it from India or abroad would not change a whole lot. Uh, your uh, postdoc opportunities may be a little limited uh, if you were directly coming from India, but again, it's not something that you cannot. I, I told you I have friends who did their PhDs in India and they went to do postdoctoral fellowship everywhere in, in, in the world. Those opportunities are always open. Finally, we are at the last question. Given a one line, what wise words of advice would you like to share with our driven inwards in one line? Dr. Sanil, start. Maybe I'll add to what Disha had said earlier. Uh, she said uh, something like, research it to hell. I would add to that, research it to hell to make it your heaven. If I would let other folks go after that, I will conclude with my, I do have a couple of things to add here. Uh, no. Unfair, that thing has already uh, stolen my line, but uh, well, <laughs> but yes, very rightly research it to Helen. As I said earlier, I, I do stand by ask, don't be shy to ask. Don't be afraid of a no, because we, we understand that it can't be a yes all the time. But hey, it's always a 50-50 person chance. It's a 50% yes, it's a 50% no, but it's a 50% yes. So be shameless, ask your questions, don't be afraid, and go for it. And wish you all all the very best. All right, if I, oh, sorry, Hina, go ahead. Yeah, Dr. Hina, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> Okay. Um, no, what I, I just uh, want to add, like, of course, uh, I mean, I think uh, Dr. Singh and Dr. Disha have both uh, summed it up really, really well. You have to really go for what you want. Um, make sure that uh, you know what you're doing. Even if you don't, it's still fine. Um, but uh, my thing uh, also is to work, keep working, learn new things, uh, get practical experience if, you know, so that you l work in different uh you know, feels in in the profession so that you know what you like and what you don't. And I mean, eventually you'll come to a conclusion, uh, you know, whether where, what you want to do in life. So I think um, that's my two bits. Just keep working. All right. I want to add my 10 cents here. First of all, you don't have to be you don't have to know everything to be successful in life. I definitely tell this to everybody. And it definitely does apply. You don't necessarily need to be an expert to be able to, to obtain an admission or you're, you're seeking admission at a university or, you know, or a program, you wanna learn. You know? So people are not expecting you to be, to be the perfect in that field because you're gaining training. You have to have motivation. If your goal is to study abroad, work abroad, live abroad, if you do not have the motivation in that field and love and passion for that field, it's not going to go anywhere. Some, some people had asked in the comments, 
Does applications get rejected? You will seek failures. You will have failures in your life. Your applications will get rejected. If I show you my list, I had like, a, like Disha was showing you a paper. There's so many universities I had applied to in the beginning, in the initial stages for seeking masters or PhD. I had multiple rejections. Even University of California, I got a rejection two years before I was actually got actually got the residency there. So failure should not stop you. You got to be persistent. You got to have motivation, persistence, and, and duration to actually stress. It is a big step in your life. It's not easy. Some Yeah, some people are lucky. It, for them, it may be a straight shot and they're in. But it, typically, it does take a lot of effort. It does take a lot of courage to go through. Be persistent. Failure should not stop you. As long as you're persistent, you have your goal, you know what you want to achieve. Maybe you may not achieve this year. Apply next year. Try to improve on those things that did not work out this year. Um, so those are the things. Again, passion, motivation, uh, love for that field. Things will work out. And, and yeah, have faith in yourself. Be confident in your in your activities and what you do. Seek help. Contact your mentors in India. Talk to them and say, I want to establish my career in this field. Can you give me opportunities? Can you provide me some assistance here so that I can build my CV? You know, build your CV. Start building it now. Look up opportunities. Research well as much as you can. Know about that particular field you want to go. Explore opportunities. We are here to help you. If you need further guidance, you know, our, our hosts should be able to provide you our contact details, our, our email addresses. If you have any specific questions in a particular field, you know, or in our area of expertise, feel free to contact us. You know, um, at least for me, definitely I'm available. Uh, I may not be able to respond to you immediately, but with, whenever I have time, I will reply to your email or your, your respond to your, to your request. Uh, be confident and, you know, have faith in yourself and faith in God you will be successful. Thank you so much. I can thank you all our panelists for your words. Like That would have motivated us plus. I don't know. I'm just happy to be here being, being a speaker to all four of you. Um, if there's nothing, I would like to conclude. OK. So IBS India is very thankful for all our panelists uh, for taking so much time from their schedules, managing time differences, and being here for all of us, and for all the students, and giving us so much information and sh sharing your life experiences. This has really helped all the students in getting clarity about how to plan their future. Thank you for being patient uh, with all our questions. You guys are really good uh, panelists. OK. Also, for all our viewers, we have part two for Wet Set Go Career Opportunities in Veterinary Field uh, tomorrow at 11 AM and 4 PM. So do tune in tomorrow as well. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Just thank you once again. It was lovely uh, sharing this panel with uh, not just uh, Manoj and Malika, but also with Dr. Singh, uh, Hena, and Zafar. Uh, thanks, guys. It's been great uh, getting to know you, and I hope we can uh, continue. We may keep in touch as well. Um, absolutely, also, absolutely. Yes. Uh, also, ma'am, we would love sure. to, we would love the list that you have uh, pulled out for us, the uh, scholarship yes. list. Yes. 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 It's right. I hope. Uh, <laughs> well, it is still legible, and I hope that most of them. I've already put crosses and ticks, and uh, I hope uh, my homework. Uh, helps you guys and uh, much like Muzaffar, uh, do write to me if you need help and if not immediately I will get uh, as soon as I'm able to. Thanks guys. Well thanks everyone again and it's been a great pleasure again meeting all our panelists from different continents so certainly a pleasure and and getting to share our experiences uh, definitely uh, you know wonderful. Same here great to have shared the platform with you and hopefully the next time I mean Mumbai, I'll visit my two colleagues. Uh, it's a pity I was there in, in March and actually delivered the lecture at BBC, but it was a bit of a rush trip and I just missed COVID by two days, so I got some <laughs> tape. <laughs> Great. Yes, sir. Do come, to BBC. Do come to BBC and uh, give us a lecture. It'll be good for us as well again. Like Your experiences and what we want to learn from. Pleasure.
so it's been uh, really amazing uh, thank you you know all the students honestly when we were in college we didn't uh, have this uh, uh, kind of stuff you know i mean oh, we were just too lazy to even plan this kind of stuff so i mean kudos to you guys um so thank you guys so much it was really great uh, and i'm so glad i've uh, had a chance to meet uh, you know these three amazing people as well same here okay i guess we can end this thank you all for being a part of this it was wonderful for me taking being the speaker uh, to our viewers uh, i want to say is we'll be tomorrow as well stay tuned and stay safe thanks everybody be safe bye, bye. bye.